Welcome to Back in the Bedroom, Episode 5. That was Emmy Ferguson playing The Broom of the Cat and Nose, uh, Scott's tune transcribed by the Italian violinist Francesco Gemiani in his treatise published in 1749. So you might have noticed little notes between and around uh, the notes of the main melody. Um, this was Emmy's ornamentation, which gives a kind of detailed and personal life to her rendition of this tune. So this is the second episode in a series on histories of emotion and affect. And in the last episode, I looked at uh, 17th century Italian music and theories of emotion. And in this episode, I'm going to turn to the 18th century. Um, and specifically, I'm going to look at Gemiani's treatise on good taste in the art of music, which focuses largely on ornamentation as the musical technique by which 18th century performers demonstrated their imagination and musical understanding. So in this episode, I'm, I'm also going to look uh, at the ways in which the Italian classical tradition practiced and taught by composers like Gemignani um, encountered Scottish folk fiddle and dance music. So Gemignani was an Italian violinist who lived between 1687 and 1762 and who studied with the famous Roman violinist and composer Arcangelo Corelli. Gemignani used his connection to, with Corelli to help garner fame and reputation in uh, Britain, and he moved between London, Edinburgh, Dublin, and Paris um, in his attempts to make a living as a musician, um, either through securing noble patronage or through publishing and performing his own music and musical treatises. So this is the uh, cover of his treatise on the good taste in the art of music. And as you can see, it's uh, dedicated to His Royal Highness, Frederick, the Prince of Wales. And this was pretty typical in his time. Uh, composers would often dedicate their works to uh, patrons or prospective patrons um, in order to try and make some kind of living as a musician. So good taste by Gemiani's definition and uh, by a lot of 18th century understandings of taste meant the ability to mediate between one's imagination and one's understanding of musical conventions and rules. Gemignani posits a significant overlap between taste and ornamentation, and sometimes appears to use terms almost interchangeably, um, but I think we can understand ornamentation as basically the musical technique by which performers demonstrated their taste. So I'm going to look at uh, his at Gemignani's list of 14 ornaments, which show the ways in which he thought of ornamentation as expressing or representing specific emotions and affects. So in the previous episode, we looked at 17th century theories of emotion, um, and we noticed the ways in which uh, different kinds of physical and musical emotions were thought to correspond to emotions felt in the mind and soul of the listener. Um, but there weren't any sort of specific links posited between uh, specific ornaments or techniques and specific emotions or affects. Here uh, in Gemignani's 18th century treatise, uh, we see a pedagogical rubric which links specific ornaments to specific affects and emotions. All right, so let's start by looking at the uh, second ornament in his table of 14 ornaments. This one is uh, on the turned shake, which is basically a trill with a little lower note addendum. He's saying the turned shake, if you make it quick and long, it expresses gaiety. Um, but if you make it short and continue the length of the note, plain and soft, it may then express some of the more tender passions. So the sixth ornament is the staccato, and this is the shortening of a note, which expresses rest, taking a breath, or changing a word. So this ornament is uh, directly linked to the voice uh, in speech and in song and rhetoric. So let's look at the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th ornaments 
which are basically ways to vary the dynamic of the melody and to create variety and expression, again, in imitation of a discourse, that is, in imitation of an order who, by raising and falling their voice, rouses different passions in the listener. So the swelling and the falling sound, he gives And in the piano and forte, now the twelfth ornament, the separation, is actually a combination of different ornaments, but it starts with the first note that rises either an interval of a second or a third, and then to this rising note an ornament is added, which resolves with an appoggiatura. He explains that the affect of tenderness is expressed. Now another uh, example of the separation is one that adds a turned shake rather than simply a shake. So the 13th ornament is the beat, which is basically a lower note trill. Um, and he explains that there are many different varieties of the beat, which can express a huge range of different emotions. He says if you play it with strength and continue it long, it expresses fury, anger, resolution. But if you play it less strong and shorter, it expresses mirth, satisfaction. And if you play it quite soft and you swell the note, it may then denote horror, fear, grief, and lamentation. And if you make it short and you swell the note gently, it may express affection and pleasure. So although Gemignani um, is here looking at ornamentation as a primary indicator of taste in the classical Italian style, um, ornamentation in the Scots folk tradition uh, was incredibly cultivated, and not just in the Scots folk tradition, but in folk traditions throughout Europe, for example, uh, in the Italian violinist and composer Giuseppe Tartini's treatise on ornamentation, um, he references a lot of Italian folk traditions. Um, and also the famous Scots fiddler, Neil Gow. The collections under his name show also show an incredibly nuanced attention to ornaments in the multiple repetitions of relatively simple melodies. Or just listening to the recordings of, of great Irish fiddlers like Tommy Potts or Martin Hayes, um, you can immediately hear them employing different uh, dynamics, swells, trills, turns, shakes, etc. Um, to produce really visceral emotional responses in their listeners. So now let's return to the tune that we opened this episode with, The Broom of Cat and Nose, which was performed by Emmy Ferguson, um, and trace a little bit of its um, history before Gemignani. This tune in written documents uh, originally appears in John Playford's The Dancing Master, which had editions published from uh, and republished from 1651 to 1728. Sir John Playford uh, transcribed the music for many English country dances. So here, uh, the broom of cotton nose, which Playford calls the bonnie bonnie broom. In the top, we can see the, uh, the melody notated. And at the bottom, we see the text descriptions of how you dance to this tune. So I'll play this melody as originally transcribed by John Playford. <laughs> Barbara Downey points out in her dissertation on Scots fiddlers um, like William McKibben and Neil Gow, um, these musicians were often dance masters and they played at dance halls as well as at private homes and they didn't necessarily play for a different class of 
audience than uh, classical musicians, but they definitely had larger audiences, and at the same time, they had a much harder time making a living as professional musicians. As we can see in Gemignani's treatise, he actually uh, very consciously plays up the prestige of his classical background. So in the preface of his treatise, he, he writes about two composers of music who have appeared in the world, who have raised my admiration, namely David Rizzio and, and uh, Giovanni Battista Lulli. So Gemignani, Gemignani basically is implying here that it takes learned Italian musicians to civilize the rude and barbarous Scots music. If this attitude was shared by David Rizzio, it didn't turn out so well for him, um, given that he was killed by some murderous Scots for getting too close to the Queen Mary. So Gemignani also writes that melody, though pleasing to all, seldom communicates the highest degree of pleasure. Uh, and it was owing to this reflection that I have lately undertaken to improve the melody of Rizzio into harmony by converting some of his airs into two, three, and four parts, and by making such additions and accompaniments to others as should give them all the variety and fullness required in a concert. So here Gemignani is implying that uh, the techniques of counterpoint and harmony in the Italian classical tradition are needed to elevate Scott's music to its highest degree of pleasure. Um, so he, here again we see him leveraging his foreignness and his connection to the Roman classical tradition in order to impress his patrons and readers. So Gemignani's treatise, which uh, features many Scots tunes, um, typifies some of the meetings between Italian and Scots musicians and music in the 18th century. Um, both Italian foreigners and also Scottish composers trying to make a living as a classical musician um, would take different Scots tunes and through sets of variations, through gallant phrasing, figured bass, harmony, and counterpoint, um, they would start to make them resemble the Italian sonatas of people like Corelli. So now I'm going to play The Broom of Cattanose in four parts with um, Emmy Ferguson on flute, uh, Mikhail Darmani on harpsichord, and Doug Balliot on bass. And we're going to hear the ways in which Geminiani took this original Scots tune, modified it a bit, and added different uh, parts and Italian techniques and forms. <laughs> So um, in Gemignani's definition, the, the taste that we as musicians might have shown in that recording would have come from our choices in ornamentation in the case of Emmy and myself, um, or in the case of Doug and Mikhail, would have come largely through the, not only their phrasing, but also the, the notes that they chose to realize the figured bass accompaniment. So while Gemignani describes these ornaments as though they come out of the Italian classical tradition, uh, it's also likely that a lot of this ornamentation was inspired by Scots fiddling traditions, and that Gemignani likely appropriated um, not only melodies, but also ornaments. However, this uh, appropriation didn't just go one way. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, lots of Scottish composers would also take Italian forms and techniques the Scots fiddler Neil Gow, who lived between 1727 and 1807, uh, was a notable example um, as perhaps the only uh, Scottish musician who was able to make a living as a folk fiddler in, in his time. So as noted by Barbara Downey in her dissertation, um, Neil Gow's son, Nathaniel, capitalized on Neil's reputation 
by publishing six volumes of Strats Bay Reels, um, and he collected the work of many different composers and students of Neil Gao under the Gao name. As Downey writes, Nathaniel had deliberately blurred the line between genuinely traditional tunes and new tunes made to look ancient and anonymous because the composer's name had been omitted. The fact that Neil Gao's name headed the entire operation sealed the mystical image of the collections, his reputation as an honest Highland figure, his refusal to leave his hometown or to defer to the upper classes. So both Nathaniel Gao and Geminiani capitalized on the reputation of their forebears, that is, Neil Gao and Corelli. Both Nathaniel Gao and Geminiani um, have provided us with some documentation on some really stunning music um, as well as on the melodies and ornaments of their time and their correspondence to emotional and affective meaning. So of course, uh, Geminiani's rubric of ornaments gives a pretty reductive um, image of uh, both the ornaments um, and also the emotions that they correspond to. Uh, but at the same time, it's useful in terms of uh, demonstrating the building blocks of musical taste and expression in his time, and one can imagine the ways in which both the ornaments and the emotions and affects would be synthesized and combined to create very complex expressions. I'm going to end the episode today with performance of Neil Gao's Lament for the death of his second wife, and as you're listening, um, you, can try, you can start to identify maybe some of the ornaments that Geminiani was pointing to, and you can decide for yourself the emotional shadings and colors that these ornaments add to the melody. <laughs>